Hello, everyone. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all participants and audience members uh, for this next event in World Forestry Week. Um, we, we're going to be talking here about food systems transformation, land use and deforestation. And I'd like to uh, introduce myself briefly. My name is Astrid Agostini. I'm the coordinator of FAO's work on Red Plus on reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation and on national forest monitoring. And I'm also a member of the management group of the UN Red Program, which is a flagship partnership of FAO, UNDP and UNEP to support countries to halt deforestation. It's my very great pleasure to moderate today's event on food systems transformation, land use and deforestation. And before I introduce the topic and the excellent panel of speakers, I wanted to start off with just a few logistical remarks. You may have already seen this. Um, interpretation is available in English, French and Spanish and can be selected in the bottom bar. Please note also that the session will be recorded and it will be published on the FAO webpage. You can use the hashtag at COFO25 to connect with us on Twitter and tweet at FAO Forestry, also to see the key highlights from both World Forestry Week and from the COFO sessions. Today, in today's session, because we have a very tight program and, uh, and very, um, very good speakers that we want to, whose insight we want to share with you, we will not have a chance, unfortunately, to take an audience Q&A. Um, but audience members that are connected on Zoom can post in the chat box. Uh, and we welcome comments and links that are pertinent to the topic that we're discussing today. This is also very relevant because while today's event is, a, is an event in its own right, uh, the timing is very uh, fortuitous because uh, next week we will have FAO's Committee on Forestry in its 25th meetings. And deforestation and food systems are very high on the agenda. There'll be a high level dialogue on turning the tide on deforestation on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, the committee will deliberate specifically on food systems and deforestation and come up with recommendations for action, both by member countries and of course, also for the FAO Secretariat. So the insights from today's session should directly feed also into this momentum for decisions and for action. And also in the broader sense, of course, going into next year's major events, uh, COP26, the World Forestry Congress, and the UN Food System Summit that are all happening in 2021, and will provide us an opportunity to really galvanize global and country action towards transformational change that ensures a healthy planet. So now focusing specifically on the session and introducing the topic, why are we talking about food systems transformation, land use and deforestation? Well, deforestation continues at alarming rates. We've already heard this today. Uh, agriculture is the main driver of deforestation and this holds true in all regions. But there are differences, of course, between commercial agricultural pressure and those posed by subsistence agriculture. But it's not just the way we produce food, but also what we eat and how what we produce gets from where it's produced to, uh, from farmers to the consumers that has profound implications on pressures on forests. The discussions we're having on food systems transformation and discussions on integrated production, on ensuring sustainable landscapes, they're very prominent at the moment. There's a lot of attention. But we also see that some of these discussions are disjointed. And we're all very quick uh, to call for a food systems approach, to have a systematic approach. And yet in practice, we also end up very quickly focusing on one part of the puzzle or some parts of the puzzle, how to produce sustainably, how to make a living from agriculture, how to protect resources, or how to adopt healthy diets, how to educate consumers, how do we organize markets. What we want to try to attempt in today's event is to explore how the critical aspect of land use and deforestation should be considered and addressed across the breadth of interventions that will allow us to deliver a sustainable food system. And with me to explore and discuss these matters and share insights from some key analytical work and policy work, as well as country experience, I have a very distinguished panel of experts who I'd like to introduce to you briefly. So we have uh, Tim Searchinger, who's a research scholar at Princeton University and the lead author 
of the World Resources Report, Creating a Sustainable Food Future, which is produced by the World Resources Institute. We have Per Faro, who's the co-director, International Climate and Forest Initiative in the Ministry of Climate and Environment in Norway. He's the co-lead author of Growing Better, 10 Critical Transitions to Transform Food and Land Use, which was produced by the Food and Land Use Coalition. And Tim and Per will respectively share insights from these key reports. We will then have a country perspective to see how this really fans out at country level. And we're joined by Agustus Dianto, who's the Director General of the Agency for Research, Development and Innovation in the Ministry of Environment and Forestry of Indonesia. And having heard from these three speakers, we will have three experts to provide some reflections on these findings and country insights and to offer their proposals and further considerations for how to uh, upscale action and how to ensure sustainability. We have Leslie Lipper, visiting fellow from Cornell University, Saswati Bora, head of food systems innovation at the World Economic Forum, and Jamie Morrison, who's the director of food systems and food safety at FAO. You can find more information about all the speakers on our events website. And I also wanted to note that uh, two of the six are joining us at 6 a.m. in the morning, and one is joining from holiday. So I think this really shows the um, important momentum and how much dedication there is to try and capture this momentum for change. And so with a big thank you for this participation up front, and without further ado, I'd like to hand over to the first presenter. So Tim, you have the floor. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Okay, great. And let me start my slideshow. So thanks everyone. Um, actually, of course, starting at 6 a.m. is appropriate if you're on a farming panel. And uh, this is the report we produced. It took about eight years, about 560 pages for the World Bank, UN, and WRI. And you can see the citation, uh, the where you can find it here. There's a technical summary. So everything I'm about to say is covered, obviously, in much more detail in that report. And let me just start by saying, okay, here's the global land use challenge. Uh, agriculture, as you know, already occupies half of the world's vegetated land. And we are going to need, between our study focused on the 2010 to 2050 period, uh, we're going to need uh, more than 50% more crops. Uh, the projection is also for 70% more livestock products and more than 80% uh, more ruminant livestock products, in particular ruminant meat uh, or beef and uh, lamb, which is the most land intensive food. And if we don't close that gap, if we don't produce that much more food per year by 2050, uh, we're going to not be able to feed everyone. So obviously that's critical. Uh, the problem is, of course, that producing that much more food, among other things, will take more land. So we projected under kind of historical yield gains that even if we did that at historical yield gains, we would clear about another 600 million hectares of land and about two thirds of that for pasture. I wanna keep focusing on that. People tend not to pay enough attention to pasture. A third of the world's pasture was historically forested and that means we're gonna clear more forest for pasture. If we just uh, followed yield gains over the previous 20 years, uh, in fact, we clear more land. And then this is what I really wanna focus your attention on. If we didn't uh, improve our, our livestock outputs, our livestock efficiencies, and our crop yields, we would have to clear more than 3 billion hectares of land. Then there basically wouldn't be a forest left on the planet. So even though we think if we just kind of maintain historical yields, which is a challenge, we'll only clear 600 million hectares, about twice the size of India, uh, the reality is we really have to dramatically, dramatically increase yields uh, to avoid clearing a lot more land. And so just to illustrate that, our baseline is this problem, but already implicit in our baseline are yield gains that avoid more than two and a half billion hectares of land clearing. And if we don't do this, by the way, uh, what we're gonna happen is agriculture and land use change, which today contribute about a quarter, about uh, 12 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions, that will increase to 15. If we really want to solve climate change, we need that to go down to four gigatons. 
If not, agriculture alone will contribute 70% of the allowable emissions from all human sources. So in other words, we need to present more than 50, produce more than 50% more food with one third of the emissions by 2050. So here's the first lesson, that if all we do is protect forests, but we don't increase crop yields, we don't increase productivity and livestock yields, it won't work. We're gonna clear land. We're gonna clear land because we have to. The second uh, lesson is that every solution requires, among other things, uh, ways to hold down demand. And so I'm, this is our elaborate 22 menu item uh, set of uh, solutions to solving climate change. The first category after those yield gains is reducing demand. Above all, that means holding down uh, beef consumption by the rich. So 20% of the world's wealthy, 20% uh, of the world eats significant amounts of beef and those people have to eat about 50% less beef. But we also have to avoid expanding bioenergy, food, reduce food loss and waste. That's critical. And meanwhile, we're doing the opposite. So this is, uh, uh, the world has started just cutting down trees to burn them in power plants. Uh, to give you some idea, if the world wants to produce 2% more energy from wood, that would require doubling the harvest of the commercial harvest of wood, which obviously is not compatible with protecting forests. And one problem with all bioenergy is it's incredibly inefficient. Sugarcane ethanol converts only 0.2% of the energy in the sun into usable energy. Uh, even optimistically, uh, switchgrass or uh, cellulosic ethanol would be only 0.35%. By contrast, right now, off the, you can get 20% efficiency from, um, from uh, photovoltaics right off the shelf. And basically that means we can produce 100 times more usable energy using solar means and bioenergy. And therefore any significant increase in bioenergy makes these goals impossible. So lesson two, reductions in consumption growth are critical. Lesson three is there's no free land. Um, you look at all kinds of global strategies and everyone wants to claim that they're gonna use tropical pasture land. So we're gonna use tropical pasture land for reforestation. We're gonna use it for, uh, to make more wood from plantations. We're gonna use it uh, for bioenergy. But the reality is that we're, we need about an 80% increase in meat uh, or beef, that's the projection. And even if we hold down our beef consumption, we need to double the pasture of every a hectare in Brazil, as an example, because we can't produce that much more food on dry land. So this land is already spoken for. Uh, uh, similarly, people sometimes think, well, we can use abandoned agricultural land, right? So the kind of low carbon land as opposed to more active agricultural land. But in fact, abandoned agricultural land uh, reforests and is critical. So here's a map, for example, of Latin America, what happened in 2001, 2010. You have this deforestation in red, but you have reforestation in blue. And globally, for every two hectares of land we deforest, we abandon one hectare of land, probably roughly, we're not 100% sure, that reforests. So if we use that abandoned agricultural land for other purposes, we're gonna double the rate of global deforestation on a net basis. And so for example, you'll see papers that say, well, look, we have all this available land for palm plantations. It is obviously much better to go into this type of land than this type of land for a palm plantation. But in fact, if you look at these lands, these are lands that we also need to reforest and will reforest if we don't use them for agricultural use. So what we really need is to increase the yields uh, as, and hold down demand. No land is free. And you saw papers that claimed that woody savannas were free. There was a paper, in fact, partially authored by the FAO, claiming that all of this area in, in, um, in uh, Africa was essentially free land for bioenergy or increasing crop production. That land looks like this, it looks like this. Uh, and in fact, it's got wild, extremely biodiverse, has a lot of carbon. Uh, I did a paper in 2015 that showed that this was not in fact low carbon land for food production or for bioenergy. Oh, you can follow that up. Okay, so no free land. So we need, we need yield increases and that's critical. But here's the wicked problem. We know that frequently when you increase yields, you get more land shifting and more land clearing locally. So in Brazil, for example, we've had increases in maize yields, increases in soybean yields, and we've also had expansion of agricultural land in Brazil. 
Why is that? Because of course that puts Brazil in a better competitive situation. And those yield gains are critical to saving land globally, but they also contribute to this uh, shifting, which is clearing more land locally. And that means more carbon rich land, that means immediate carbon losses, that means biodiversity effects. And so yield gain, what this means is yield gains alone don't necessarily protect forests. And that's particularly true as we're on a road building binge around the world. And as you build roads through forests, you get a shifting of agricultural land into clearing new forests while abandoning land elsewhere. And if we have the, this is kind of potential roads from a study in, in uh, big roads in Africa. If you build all those roads, there's no way we're gonna protect the world's forest. So the lesson four is while production, increasing yields on the same land is critical, unless those are explicitly linked through governance to protection of forests, it's not gonna work. That implies there's a global deal to be made where the whole world has a stake in helping to boost yields uh, in developing countries, but in return, those developing countries have to use them to protect forests. So this last couple of comments, one challenge in doing this is we have all kinds of perverse uh, accounting rules that reward people in climate change for either the wrong activity or not sufficient activity. So for example, under national laws, countries don't get a, any kind of incentive. They don't get any reward for reducing their consumption unless they reduce their production. So if countries switch to more um, uh, uh, less beef diets, <clears throat> they're not rewarded for reducing greenhouse gas emissions unless they reduce their production globally. So if, that's not enough. Companies are saying we're going to buy from recently defore from land that isn't been recently deforested, and that's good. But in fact, unless they boost yields on existing land, all they're going to do is move agricultural land around. We have a perverse rule that basically treats all biomass as carbon neutral, meaning that it does, if you burn biomass instead of coal, that's viewed as being not adding carbon to the atmosphere. And that explains why you have people proposing to double commercial wood harvest to produce 2% of the world's energy. And that similarly is a view that, well, what if we only uh, uh, burn the amount of growth that's occurring in forests? Uh, then that's carbon neutral. But in fact, the growth of forests, a lot of it is due to higher carbon dioxide concentrations, to higher nitrogen. That is a beneficial feedback from climate change itself that is holding down climate change. And if we, in fact, burn up that carbon sink, we're still adding carbon to the atmosphere. So I'll just leave you with this thought. This is a map of the potential productivity of native vegetation in the world, how much carbon it takes up per year. And uh, we haven't improved on that. Human activity has lowered that. We're roughly stuck with that amount of global land use productivity. We can improve yields so we don't diminish it as much. We, but basically that is the amount of units of potential plant growth we have in the world. And we have to get more carbon storage. We need to have more um, food. And the only way to do both is to make more efficient use of land. And so, we need rules that basically encourage that more efficient use of land. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Tim, for sharing these insights and very um, clear points for thoughts and for need for urgent action. Um, I would like to invite directly Pear to come in and provide the perspective from the, from the follow, looking at the, the whole food systems and to pick up uh, from where Tim left us with, uh, with the overview on, uh, on land use requirements and the need to really uh, look at efficiency. Per, over to you. Thank you, Astrid, and thank you, Tim, for an excellent uh, kickoff. Um, and um, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you to FAO for hosting, and thank you for inviting me to be part of such an esteemed panel. The first test, of course, is whether I'm actually able to share my screen. Right. So, um, essentially, uh, I am going to try and um, introduce you to the key findings of the Food and Land Use um, Global Consultation, uh, Food and Land Use Coalition Global Consultation Report. Um, I want to emphasize that while I'm I'm back in my day job with the Norwegian Climate and Forest Initiative, I am 
now speaking with my Foldu uh, hat on. Um, another caution up front, this is a global report. Uh, the findings, the conclusions, the numbers, they are global. It'll break down differently um, in different countries and different regions. Um, and if you want to have a clear picture of how this would work in a specific country, you need to actually do the anal analytics and the synthesis uh, country specific. But we feel that the global picture gives a go good glimpse of, of, of uh, what is needed. Um, I'd also add that there is there is no new science uh, in this. We're essentially basing ourselves on IPCC, IPAS, various stuff on, on nutrition, uh, Tim's and the World Bank, WRI um, report that Tim just introduced it to and, and so on. Um, and the aim is to look at what is actually needed to go from here to there in terms of the economics, the finance, the policy and so on. The exam question that the Food and Land Use Coalition uh, asked itself in initiating the work on this report is how can we, how can we deliver on uh, the food and land use system SDGs uh, simultaneously. And that is that is the key because we know that there are food security issues, there are rural development and growth issues, there are health issues, climate, biodiversity, nature issues, um, and we know that if we fail to deliver on either one of them, we will fail on all. Uh, so the basic exam question is: Can we deliver on these goals simultaneously through the same? reform agenda. The basic answer to that is yes, uh, as the report aims to, to uh, demonstrate. We can have better environment in terms of uh, food and land use systems actually being net carbon neutral, um, drastically reducing and then halting biodiversity loss, restoring fish stocks, etc. This can be done by eliminating undernutrition and having the disease burden associated with too many calories. Um, it can also help boost income growth for the bottom 20% of rural populations uh, globally and increase, increase food security significantly for everyone, but most particularly for the most vulnerable, poorest parts of the global population. So it is possible uh, to deliver on all these goals. Unfortunately, that's definitely not where we are heading. Um, if you look at this slide, uh, it essentially takes the approach of hidden costs, meaning costs that are incurred by food and land use systems, but not really financed directly by those that uh, create them. Um, if you look at the, the left uh, column, uh, that is status quo 2018. Uh, hidden costs related to obesity, uh, 2.7 trillion, uh, undernutrition, 1.8 trillion, pollution, 2.1, climate change, 1.5, etc. So what we've essentially tried is to put conservative pricing estimates on, on these uh, hidden costs. For example, on climate change, we've used a social cost of carbon of 100 uh, dollars per ton, which is arguably too low, um, but still, and, and similarly throughout these categories. The number is so big that it's it's a bit hard to relate to, but this is more than the GDP of China uh, as comparison. It is also more uh, than uh, the net GDP of the system as such, meaning uh, food and land use systems are really, if you take every consequence into account, net negative for the global economy. That obviously does not mean we should stop producing food, but it does mean that there are enormous costs that are pushed onto other sectors, especially health sectors and productivity sectors, um, and into the future through uh, climate change uh, and nature loss. Even more um, discouraging is that if you look at the path going forward, what we tried to do was to model two scenarios. Um, the second column, uh, the mid middle column is current trends. That is essentially a, bis a, a relatively sanguine business as usual scenario, so moderate reforms. That leaves us with growing um, hidden costs, which means, for example, that the Paris climate change targets will be out of reach, um, similarly on, on all the other counts. The alternative that we modeled is a radical uh, 
reform scenario, which we termed better futures. And as we can see, there is a drastic, already by 2030, a drastic reduction in this hidden costs by um, more than uh, 5 trillion annually, and that trend continues towards 2050. The question, of course, is how do we realize this better futures scenario? And what we've tried to do is, is to outline the reform scenario that would deliver on the assumptions that we use to model the better uh, futures uh, scenario. And we chose, you can obviously organize these uh, reform agendas different ways. We chose to organize them around 10 critical transitions. Um, starting organized in a pyramid as you can see on this slide essentially starting with healthy diet because the demand side of this is is absolutely crucial um, so this is about a convergence of global diets to um, healthier for human and healthier for the planet that means for example and in the western north we'll have to reduce significantly meat consumption and especially red meat consumption it means generally a global uh, higher uh, consumption of fruits and vegetables, generally a global reduction in salt and sugar consumption, and so on. The point is convergence around a diet that is good for humans and good for the environment. There is no time to go through all of these um, uh, critical transitions, but the key point is that this is not an a la carte menu. It's a set menu. You actually have to, on a global scale, all of these times have to be delivered on. For the purposes of today, of course, um, the third one, protecting and restoring nature is absolutely key there is no scenario in the ipcc um, that gets us um, to uh, the paris agreement targets without halting the destruction of nature and, and deforestation particularly um, yesterday um, so that has to happen uh, very rapidly but as tim pointed out to do that you also need more productive regenerative agriculture you need to extract more value from the oceans while keeping it healthy there's a massive issue around reducing food loss and waste, et cetera. So this is one integrated agenda. I would also emphasize that, especially in a developing world and, and around the tropics where most of the forest loss is currently ongoing, uh, the lower to uh, stronger rural livelihoods, which is essentially investments um, in infrastructure, transport, digital uh, energy infrastructure is absolutely crucial to succeed as is the issue of, of gender and demography, which boils down in a large, to a large degree to investing heavily in women's and girls' education, health, uh, including reproductive health, uh, and access to finance. The upside, of course, is, is massive, as you saw on the previous slide. There is also a very uh, intriguing business opportunity, estimated at about five trillion annually um, income. Um, this costs money. The investment requirements are estimated at 300 to 350 billion each year uh, for the transformation. That's about half a percent of, of, of global GDP, I believe. Uh, very significant investments. But the point is that the IRR is 1 to 15 or something like that. So the, this is a very profitable investment, but it is a high investment. And that means the financial component is clearly crucial financial innovation. Uh, the report is quite detailed on recommendations because this uh, this requires some massive changes in how we organize. Um, this is about actors from governments to individuals to companies to civil society taking fundamentally different choices from today in terms of what how we do things, um, what our demand is on the on foods, um, and what we invest in. Uh, and how we produce. Um, that kind of fundamental change in such a short time span requires incentive to change in a fundamental way. There's no time to go through all of them. I, I do uh, really uh, encourage you to, to read the report. I'll look here quickly at those recommendations that are most directly relevant to the land use side. Putting your price on carbon, of course, repurposing agricultural subsidies. And this is really important. We're talking repurposing, not cutting, but repurposing these subsidies to drive nutrition and nature-friendly diets and production. Scaling up payments for ecosystem services. I think this is absolutely crucial. 
unless we get used to the idea that nature provides services just like police departments do and the health service does, um, we also need uh, to realize that protecting and restoring nature costs money and, and that is going to have to be paid for. Red Plus is perhaps the most um, ready to go uh, example of this and the report um, recommends a massive upscaling of, of pay for performance uh, Red Plus. Nature protection uh, is crucial and the report um, recommends um, a moratorium on conversion of natural ecosystems, protecting fishing breeding grounds and ending illegal and overfishing. There is also strong recommendations on legal rights and recognition of indigenous people's territories and tackling environmental crime. Again, if you look only on the protection and restoration of nature, the cost is estimated to closer to 65 billion. So let's say uh, 0.7 trillion um, in a decade. That's a lot of money and it might scare some observers off. But compare that to the 11.5 trillion estimated costs of uh, COVID-19 economic damages and the fairly strong evidence that destruction of nature is, is a key driver of, of pandemics and you put the sums in a perspective. And the other side of course is the return is actually higher. The point is we have to change the rules to enable governments and businesses to realize the values that are inherent, inherent in nature. One last point um, before I close. Um, as Tim pointed out, there is no free land and how we use land is absolutely essential to whether this succeeds. Um, and the difference between many of the outcomes in better futures versus current trend scenario, you can see in the top two uh, portions of these columns, it has to do with under current trends, more um, land will be converted to pasture and cropland, meaning nature will just continue to disappear. While in better futures, through reduced food loss and waste, through changes in diets, and through more efficient production, um, you free up 1.5 billion hectares of agricultural land that can be returned to nature. That is a crucial element of this reform uh, agenda, and it drives, of course, the biodiversity outcomes and the climate outcomes in a massively positive uh, direction. The Food and Land Use Coalition has, has sort of also tried to get to the bottom of why isn't this happening and, and, and the, the existence of pervasive myths is crucial. And perhaps the most pervasive one is we must choose between economic growth, enough nutritious food and environmental sustainability. What we think we show in this report is that that is simply wrong. There is no macro level trade off. Of course, there's always micro level trade offs, individual actors facing the choice between cutting down forest and, and producing. Um, they are facing a choice, but you have to compensate uh, those people's pay for ecosystem services and change the rules. But at the macro level, we can have better production and better protection at the same time. And transformed food and land use systems can deliver on all of the SDGs including SDG2 on zero hunger, while also delivering on environmental targets and the Paris Agreement. And I think that's the key takeaway from this report. Technically, financially, technologically, in terms of the economics, we can deliver on all of these, um, all of these targets. It's essentially a question of political will and political momentum. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Per, for sharing these insights. And I think it's been it's been great to have this very comprehensive global picture. And you've reinforced the message from, from Tim that really we have urgency and that this is a tall order. But you're also concluding on the fact that it's possible. And in fact, even though investment requirements are enormous, this is a very worthwhile investment that we need to make into our future. And I think picking up from your point about the fact that the global picture is one thing, but there may be we're looking towards hopefully no macro, um, no trade-offs at the macro level, but at the micro level, there are much more difficult decisions to make. I think this is a fantastic moment then to turn over directly to, um, to Dr. Agustus Tianto from Indonesia to give us a perspective from a specific country from Indonesia um, to show how this is confronted at the country level, how some of these challenges are uh, both uh, both assess and how the strategies are put in place to meet multiple goals and to manage some of these trade-offs um, and pursue the synergies and the impact at country level. So, uh, Dr. Giustianto, I'd like to invite you to take the floor. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you, Astrid. Yeah, I would like to share the screen. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to uh, present uh, the presentation entitled Indonesia's Policies. Uh, sorry, I would like to. Yeah, Indonesia Policies on forestry sector addressing food security and environment sustainability. Yeah, I would like to cite uh, uh, the, the, the path to zero hunger by 2030 of FAO. We know that uh, four in five pe poor people live in rural areas and then a large share of food produce is lost or wasted and malnutrition affects one in three people and all nations. And then over uh, 820 million people are going hungry and increasing competition for nature, natural resources. And of course, demand for food will grow. And by the year uh, 2030, world population is projected to grow to around 8.3 billion. And we have to transform our food system to transform our world. Uh, Indonesia have a uh, corrective uh, measure for sustainable uh, forest and ecosystem management through ensuring significant reduction in the rate of deforestation and forest and degradation, and then preventing uh, forest and land fires and addressing their negative impacts on the environment, health, transportation, and economic growth. And we have also to applying the principle of environmental support and carrying capacity in the utilization of forest areas. And we also have a global cooperation to tackle climate change through an NDC commitment by reducing greenhouse gases emission through our own effort and with international assistance. And also be uh, involving community participation in access to forest management and assigning responsibility to all parties involved so that forest areas and their ecosystem are protected. Uh, by that, Indonesia has taken corrective uh, action uh, First, uh, implementing low carbon development and resilience to climate change through conservation, restoration, and sustainable management, forest and land rehabilitation, and reduction of deforestation rate. And second, changing the direction of forest management from focusing on timber to timber to forest resource ecosystem and community base. And then applying community based forest management by providing access to forest management to communities through social forestry and conservation partnership. And then uh, resolving uh, conflict related to forest tenure cases and providing legal land access to com communities through the land object program for agrarian reform, we call it TORA. And then we do also internalizing the principle of env environmental support and carrying capacity into the preparation of the national forestry plan as a macro special direction for forestry development. And then we also preventing biodiversity loss and damage to ecosystem through conservation of the area and protection of the endangered biodiversity. And lastly, we, we are preventing, mitigating and restoring damage to nat natural resources and the environment. Indonesia policies on uh, food security, we, we have a social forestry program social forestry permit and also food estate program. For social forestry program, we guaranteed management rights to people who live in a, and around the forest, especially forest farmers to be able to acquire food through agroforestry while managing forest. And also forest farmer group will also receive assistance from government to develop their business, obtain funding and access to market. Uh, regarding the social forestry permit, we uh, social forestry permit uh, given to utilize forest in the working area uh, in uh, management unit. As uh, September 2020, there is uh, 6,673 permits have been issued for around uh, 870,000 uh, families, which offer 4.2 million hectares. Regarding the food estate program, in, we do in selected and degraded lands. And the food estate program is based on corporation capital intensive program, which involves local communities by improving their capacities. The government in Indonesia also has allocated 
12.7 million hectare of forest land for social forestry program. We, we, we given uh, uh, permits through the schemes, uh, we call it file, uh, village uh, forest, community forest, people plantation forest, customary forest, forestry partnership. We also developed new strategies have been applied in response to COVID-19 pandemic to support forest farmer. For example, through Bank Persona, we give an incentive to be given to social forestry group if they implement the e-learning outcomes uh, in their business work, working, working plan by selecting cluster of forest and fruit commodities. And then through the National Economic Recovery Program, we provide uh, around uh, 200 million rupiah or around uh, uh, 13 uh, thousand for 450 uh, US dollar to each social forestry business group with aim to achieve food security through developing agroforestry and providing productive economic tools. Uh, regarding the local wisdom, we provide also education to social forestry farmers and then through the e-learning, we encourage uh, farmers to do uh, to think not egocentrically, but egocentrically by simultaneously conveying both productive ways and ecological views. Yeah, community pro empowerment program in conservation areas has already conducted through the development of conservation village, granting granting access, and then partnership facilitation recognizing uh, FO work on food system transformation. So we uh, do uh, the support uh, food system transformation to prevent uh, land use change and reduce deforestation uh, through the strengthen innovation system, for example, green and smart technology to produce high value, and then also involve communities and small, small holders to and improve their capacities to enhance productivity and income. Uh, reduce losses, encourage, reduce and recycle, and promote sustainable consumption. We do also facilitation ac uh, access to productive uh, resources, finance and services, and we encourage the diversification of production on income. We utilize and optimize uh, degraded lands and adapt to climate change, and of course, uh, strengthen coordination among stakeholders. I thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for presenting this clear case from, from Indonesia and really the breadth of different initiatives that you're undertaking to deal with the challenge of deforestation and looking at the, the needs for, um, for what needs to be put in place in terms of a food system and, and meeting the various SDGs and of course uh, hunger, food security uh, and, uh, and poverty uh, goals. Thank you also for highlighting the importance of this opportunity now in terms of building back better and using what is a, a very difficult period as, a, as also a starting block to look at how to use the recovery planning in a way to set a new path. And I think this is something we are, we are very much uh, thinking throughout these, uh, these events. And I think it's a very worthwhile point to, for us to keep in mind. Um, but in view of time, I will quickly turn over to our discussions and starting with Leslie. Uh, Leslie, you've taken a close look at some of the global reports, including those that were already presented uh, today, and you've also had many years of experience in supporting countries. And um, what are your thoughts in terms of how realistic these scenarios are in terms of getting the broad transformation um, off the ground and ensuring a smooth transition also towards what should be a more sustainable new normal? Leslie. Thank you. Can you hear me? Very well. Okay, good. Um, thank you. These are great presentations, they're great studies. They really add tremendous to our understanding, tremendous amount. I will take the very short time that I have though to mostly talk about what I see as the shortcomings or things that could be added as opposed to the really in interesting and excellent work that is in there. So first thing, Per, I like that you make a, such a strong statement that yeah, we can get environmental, nutritional, and equitable livelihood, the equitable development, all these things, there isn't a trade-off at the macro level. We can get them. And yeah, I, I actually agree, but I think it's a lot more than just saying we need then a separate sort of parallel path for development. 
And that I think overall, one of the main issues with some of these food system transformation studies is they don't integrate enough the implications for rural livelihoods. And we care about that because 80% of the people in extreme poverty, 80% of the half billion people in extreme poverty and 76% of the medium poverty are in rural areas. And they're still dependent to some extent on very low productivity and unstable agricultural livelihoods. It also matters for deforestation, although we all know, I think pretty much that poverty is not a, it's a complicated relationship with deforestation, but you care about it for the livelihoods and you care about it for deforestation. And I think it needs to be a little more specific in looking at the constraints that are coming out in getting better food system transformation. So if you put a hard constraint on all agricultural land expansion around the world, how many more people would be in poverty? I'd like to see a statistic like that. I mean, we see a lot about what it would mean for emissions. What would the opposite mean? If you put this constraint on, how many more poor people are going to see? And um, in terms of the global versus local, fine. I mean, that's fair enough that these are global reports. But I still think looking, it would be useful, particularly in this context of the rural livelihoods and equity, to look at distributional impacts. So the implications of putting a constraint, again, I'm gonna stick with the land use expansion because the focus here, the implications of that for around the world are very different. The cost and the cost to livelihoods, the cost to, and also say the benefits you would get from the land as Tim showed in that last slide. I mean, there's a huge variation in the, across geographies of what you're going to get on the environment side, but also what you're going to cause on the livelihood side. And there's, a, there's an equity argument that you would be putting in constraints to meet environmental problems that haven't been caused by poor people, but that would affect them. And so I think at least that needs to be much more directly and specifically in the big messaging of like, yes, this everybody has to work together on this, but it doesn't mean everybody has the same cost to deal with it. Um, in terms of solutions, let me see. Okay, I have a couple more minutes. In terms of solutions, the sustainable ag intensification is a big one and there's very interesting stuff in the two reports. And also just in um, some of the ideas that was put forward from Indonesia. I would say though, at least I'd propose to you guys, it's probably not gonna work as a strategy, a short-term strategy to get a lot of people out of poverty that are in rural areas right now and where there is also a projected high rates of population growth. Because it takes time to get the institutions in place, it takes time to get the environmental services and ecosystems in a, new di in a new equilibrium. And we have experience that shows that, you know, we haven't had great adoption rates. It's very complicated to get it to work. So, uh, and, and I, Value chains is another one that's come up in all the reports and in the Indonesia study, which has a lot of promise for short-term employment gains. So in terms of closing up my remarks, one of the things is, uh, I just wanna really emphasize that the issue of rural livelihoods should be absolutely integrated in the dynamics of food system transformation. So changing in the consumption patterns, changing in the agricultural land use patterns changing in agricultural production systems. So not as a separate pillar. And in reading through the reports and also just listening to the presentation just now on Indonesia, I think one of the things we're seeing is a move from looking at homogeneity in production systems, homogeneity in value chains. So we want to level fields, we wanna use a standardized set of inputs, we monocrop, and then we have a standardized set of vegetable product standards to go through um, our value chains. And now we're moving much more to heterogeneity. We, want, we, we have much more heterogeneity in the fields. We deal with intercropping. We deal with different kinds of soil types and management. And same thing in the value chains. And so one of the things is to look at, but one of the reasons we haven't dealt where we've pushed on homogeneity is because there's lower costs and you can mechanize. Dealing with heterogeneity means labor, and it could be high productivity labor with new technologies. And this is an area I think that comes out without being fully articulated in some of the reports. I'll stop there.
Thank you very much, Leslie, for putting the strong emphasis on the importance of livelihoods and having to deal with this, um, this, this transition and transformation narrative in a way that makes it real and, uh, and, and ensures a just transition really at the, at the local level. Um, so coming in with a, with a complementary perspective, I'd like to call on uh, Sasha Tibora from the uh, World Economic Forum, who has been looking at a lot again at the global uh, side and how to really get the incentives right in order to move to a comprehensive new scenario. So Sashwati, may I call on you to come in? Thank you, Astrid, and thank you to uh, the um, uh, speakers, uh, the panelists for a very interesting perspective. I think most of the presentations have today highlighted that we require fundamental change in the way our food is produced, including the practices of more than 500 million smallholder farmers and the way food is consumed, which is around seven, more than 7 billion individuals currently. And to create that huge uh, shift that every uh, the panelists have alluded to, we really need to look at the role of incentives. I mean, the current incentives that are put in place uh, are have been put in place decades back when the world looked very different. But now to transition that, we need to see who's going to fund the transition cost, the economic cost, the behavior change cost, but also look at perverse incentives that are preventing participants in food system from changing their behavior. And, and of course, we, we know the role of private sector will be key here, uh, um, which uh, I haven't heard much in today's discussion, but we know that part uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships such as Tropical Forest Alliance have been trying to support the implementation of private sector commitments, but has progress has been slow because there's a lack of incentives for producers or countries who are trying to do the right thing or willing to forego the opportunity cost, but don't have the incentives to do so. So at the World Economic Forum earlier this year, we launched a report looking at how do we incentivize food systems transformation. And we currently highlighted around four big uh, incentive pathways. And I'm going to go into this in quickly and just pull out a few messages from that report. Um, so the first pathway and probably the hardest to do is to shift consumer demand to environmentally, social, uh, environmentally and socially responsible products, uh, which is happening in developed countries, but very minor still. And because to change consumer behavior requires, uh, is which is deeply rooted in habit and culture, is requires also to address afford affordability of these uh, choices, um, especially in low-income environment. So the second pathway that we highlighted uh, is on business model innovation, where private sector should redesign business model to prioritize environmental, social, and financial outcomes, which we call a triple bottom line uh, 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 benefits. And many of the companies are recognizing their future competitiveness hinges on meeting these commitments. And also a, a lot of evidence shows that a high level of purpose leads, leads to high level of profitability. So then why is the pace and scale not meeting up to what we aspire for? And I think one of some of the key reasons we highlighted is of course, the lack of enable infrastructure that we hear about quite a bit, uh, investments in roads and um, sports, supply chain challenges. But also uh, one of the main uh, things that we heard also is that the triple bottom line business models sometimes do not meet the economic return aspirations for the private sector. So frequently the increased cost of changing these business models cannot be offset by increasing demand or price shifts. So what are the mechanisms can we take put in place, like for example, in the short term, which can uh, provide this incentive. So example, like co-investments or subsidized financing. And of course, we also see that there are huge risks to changing uh, business models, which large companies are unwilling to do so. And startups and entrepreneurs who are willing to do so don't have the uh, funding to do so. And this also requires a lot of change in corporate culture, which requires us to redesign of uh, internal performance metrics, but also to look at how do we include externalities in financial performance assessments of uh, private sector uh, bottom lines, which really brings us to the third pathway, which is the role of institutional investors, including say private equity or pension funds and others, uh, who can set really high standards with respect to how companies can target environmental and social outcomes alongside profits. And we see that the sustainable investing has become quite a big um, uh, mechanism now and because uh, in, in investors are trying to address climate risk in their uh, returns on assets. But this money is not being, funding is not being unlocked to food and agriculture sector because there for a variety of reasons. And first of all, being that the hurdle rates for investments in food and agriculture is quite high. Uh, the returns do not uh, compensate for the perceived risk, which can be mitigated through blended financing and other mechanisms. And also, 
uh, in developing countries, because there's fragmentation of food systems and a huge uh, just associated transaction cost, um, there are lack of also intermediation vehicles, for example, credible funds or green bonds that can attract investment in sustainable food products. And of course, there's a huge question of lack of data and decision making, uh, which can sort of guide decision making. And of course, we need the enabling environment. Uh, also, countries need to invest in um, ownership rights, legal frameworks, and so forth uh, to make this happen. Which brings me to the fold and probably the most important pathway, and that's the actions of governments from the local to the national, which can be a huge powerful driver in because realigning policies and public sector investments, governments can change the economics that drive companies, investors, and farmers. But um, there is, of course, we heard about uh, that there is the governments have to balance a lot of priorities, economic, social, national security. And a lot of times they don't have the tools to do so. They don't have the uh, talent tools or the research uh, on what are the impact of interventions that could work, what are the trade offs. And uh, so we do need some capacity building in governments, financing for capacity building in for governments to develop this incentive related, uh, you know, trade off decisions that governments have to make. And, and, and one thing I wanted to mention, as uh, Per said, they said, there is no macro level trade offs, but there is micro level trade offs, as Leslie also alluded to. So, this requires a significant transition cost uh, at realigning public policies. So, a lot of um, the high food prices will affect vulnerable segments of the population. It may lead to loss of income for some set of growers in a country. So, we need to really create the social safety nets to compensate and protect the vulnerable segments of and population. So, just to highlight at the end, I think all of those four pathways, whether it's consumer demand change, institutional investments, business model innov innovations, or public policies, they are interconnected. And we need progress against all four uh, to realign incentives. Again, there would be trade-offs. There are transition costs to making this change. And so there is not one size fits all approach. So each country and region, region needs to adopt a bespoke approach that will involve setting transition goals and choosing which incentive pathway and actions are aligned to those goals. And then putting forward some mutually reinforcing actions, which requires them to walk across government ministries and departments and to sequence this appropriately, both at the individual um, actor, country, regional, and global level. And in this, of course, as we have seen, the role of multi-stakeholder partnerships would be key. We need coalitions of governments, private sector, civil society, bilateral, multilateral organizations, donors, to create a collective action, action to solve these really big wicked problems, as we call it. And also, the last thing I would like to say, and which I think a lot of um, part, um, the FAO paper and others have highlighted, the role of technology innovations will be key. But we cannot think that technology is a panacea in, in, in itself. We really look at, need to look at how do we create the innovation ecosystems that can leverage the role of technology in the country and regions. So with that, um, I hand it over to you, Astrid. Thank you very much. And because we are really very tight with time, I will hand over without further ado to Jamie and just note that, of course, the, I think the link to the reports also paste, uh, pasted in the uh, posted in the chat rather. Um, so, Jamie, please, for the kind of big picture perspective as the director of food systems from FAO, what are you adding? What would you like to add to this picture? Great. Thanks very much, Astrid. Um, I think just in terms of wrapping up, what, what we've seen is that the interventions today provide some very solid evidence and insights into the key issues that are challenging many of our contemporary food systems, particularly in terms of their hidden costs, but also in terms of the crisis that will result if we continue to follow the, the business as usual trajectory. I think as we've also seen, there have been um, a lot of, we have a pretty good idea of the potential solutions, or at least the elements of the solutions as set out in the menus um, that we've seen presented to us today. But I think that the key question is, is how do we make this all happen? What are the combinations of the items from the menu that are appropriate in a particular context? And I think it is that that local level that we really do see the trade-offs and the prioritization um, needing to be thought through. How do we foster the level of coordinated action and investment required from actors across the food system to ensure that real progress is made where it's needed. And I think what, you know, what, what is, is clear from the presentations as well is that technical innovations alone will not move us in the right direction quickly enough. We need much more focus on behavioral change as Saswati has, has argued. And, and this is not just changes in decisions and practices at the producer level, 
but we need to be looking at better understanding and incentivizing change of all actors in a way that forces or encourages at least uh, coordinated action. And, and as a result, we can't only look for solutions to problems close to where the negative impacts are being manifested. Uh, for example, in the discussion today, which has been very much about um, how we might regulate, restrict certain uh, land use practices to reduce levels of deforestation or ecosystem degradation, or to encourage practices that generate nature positive um, outcomes. But, but looking at these solutions close to the source may, may miss some of the more effective, efficient ways of working towards um, transformative change. For example, how can we work to change the sourcing practices of processes um, or galvanize the change in consumer demand for products which are produced in a certain way? This ultimately may provide more leverage in reducing levels of land conversion or incentivizing a shift towards sustainable production than focusing on the sort of land use um, policies. But of course, almost by definition, taking a more systemic approach brings an added level of complexity. So how do we work through this in an inclusive multi-stakeholder setting where the priorities of all stakeholders have heard? And I think Leslie made a very important point that it's often the inclusiveness of those more vulnerable groups, generally in rural areas, that we really miss in, in setting this agenda. And I see two, or a number of, of upcoming opportunities, but I'd just like to, to close by highlighting two of those. The first is that there are a number of major programs of work that are coming into alignment with the, the Food System Summit process. One of these is the GEF7 impact program on food systems, which I think will provide a significant platform for articulating and implementing a food system approach and addressing many of the critical issues that have been discussed today. And the second, of course, is that over the next 12 months, um, we have the process towards the UN Food Systems Summit, which is intended to really elevate this level of discourse and assist in finding the required level of alignment between stakeholders throughout food systems. The decision to convene the summit recognizes that it is the integrated nature of the sustainable development goals. And this is very much reflected in the, the way in which its five action tracks have been um, developed. One of those focused very much on the, the promotion of um, nature positive solutions, but it's that integration across consumer demand, um, across advancing rural livelihoods, improving resilience, which I think will really help to move this agenda forward. So thank you, Astrid. Thank you very much, Jamie, and thank you for already uh, really tying together the various insights from speakers. And we are unfortunately incredibly out of time and already over time. And so I will just wrap up very briefly by thanking all the presenters and discussants for what was an incredibly rich uh, one hour event. We will take what we've learned from here and we'll bring that into discussions in the next week's COFO discussion, as well as in these upcoming major events and the global and national consultation processes that lead hopefully to all of us being able to support a transition towards sustainable food systems. So thank you very much and goodbye.